Hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to attend this webinar. I know that this is a difficult time or a really busy time uh, in the interfaith world with Passover and Holy Week. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us and learn more about interfaith dinner dialogues. Um, my name is Kate. I am the interfaith coordinator here at Islamic Networks Group. We have been around for 24 years now and we work to combat different stereotypes against the Muslim American community. Uh, through education and dialogue and a part of that effort um, also is in interfaith. We help manage the uh, Know Your Neighbor campaign which is a national interfaith campaign which launched to the White House in 2015 and now has about 50 different members um, across the country that represent very different um, work in the interfaith world and different organizations and different perspectives on interfaith. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about interfaith inner dialogues and I really wanted to have this webinar since I started this webinar series because so many people reach out to me asking about interfaith inner dialogues and what resources are available and so I have gathered a few of our experts in interfaith inner dialogues who can talk to you about their experiences and resources that they might be able to share with you in hosting your own interfaith inner dialogue. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Chip, who is going to talk about um, his initiative, Bridges of Faith Trialogue in Cincinnati. Um, but before I do, just know that you are welcome to raise your hand within this Zoom webinar. You can see that feature if you are accessing this online. Um, you can also send us messages in chat, or you can ask us questions in the Q&A category on Zoom. Uh, so Chip, if you don't mind introducing yourself and your efforts in Cincinnati. Sure. Thank you, Kate, and greetings, everybody. Um, I am affiliated with a program that has just become actually a nonprofit called Bridges of Faith Trialog. The trialog right now is a ongoing conversation among civic leaders in Cincinnati of the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim traditions, and they meet uh, about every six weeks in in one another's homes. And they have a meal, and then we have a conversation. But let me give you a little background, if I, if I may. This particular program we have today was launched in 2003 as a Jewish-Muslim dialogue. At that time, perhaps in your own communities, we were witnessing a tremendous amount of social distance between Jewish and Muslim leaders. This was relatively after 9-11, very intense times. Well, we invited six Jewish couples, six Muslim couples, we frankly had a tremendous amount of social courage and could withstand the fact they were getting from their own faith communities to come together to get to know one another. And these are uh, leading professionals in the community uh, who were open-minded and willing to learn. And they were really making, cutting new ground in Cincinnati. So they, they came together and as one of the co-founders said, we, you know, I believe that uh, uh, breaking bread together and with spouses or significant others is a great way to, to get folks closer together and to allow them to feel warmer. And it takes the edge off of some of the stridency of the concerns that, that can otherwise happen. And so that was our format. So uh, the first meeting of, the, of these Jewish and Muslim leaders, we had a dinner in someone's home, and then they began to talk about one of those traditions. And the format was relatively simple. We had a tremendous meal, it was, and uh, then folks would sit around the living room, about 18 to 20, and then carry on some conversations that had been carried on in Cincinnati before. And over the course of four years, the relationships grew, uh, and they ended up, their conversations spilled out into the community. Uh, and they ended up doing talks on uh, local public television. And actually, in the aftermath of the war in Lebanon in 2006, they went on to, to present both the Muslim and the Jewish perspectives on the war that uh, received a tremendous amount of attention locally. They created a speakers bureau. These, and we're talking these 30 people, these activities to, uh, from these volunteers uh, took, took, took shape. They'd develop a speaker's bureau and they'd go out in trios, a Christian, a Jew, and a Muslim, to speak uh, to churches, to rotary clubs, and what have you. So that 
came out of the, this, that set of activities. In 2007, the group uh, included Christians. After developing a strong relations between them, they thought it was high time. They, uh, they brought in the folks with, uh, the, with whom they were having a, a larger relationship out in the community. So we invited six Christian couples at that point. And at that point, the dialogue became a trialogue. And so that program uh, went for another four years. And again, just purely about relationship bonding, but occasionally speaking out with a, with a mutual, with a common voice on instances of bigotry, religious bigotry, uh, uh, hatred, uh, and violence. And uh, a voice that was not otherwise heard in this community. So that happened. And then fast forward, uh, the program went on hiatus for a brief period. And in 2015, January of 2015, the presidential campaign rhetoric, the social political climate, uh, warranted a reconvening of this group. And on the strength of one email, they all came back. And uh, in the span of four weeks, adopted, uh, uh, took on uh, the cause of Muslim Americans who they felt were being especially targeted at this time. And they developed a getting to know our Muslim neighbors campaign, public education campaign. Through that campaign, they published literature pieces. Uh, through, and these were Islamophobia, not in our community. Q&A on Islam. And then what you can do to be a good ally uh, for our Muslim neighbors. And these were all distributed to area leaders. They took on three or four other major roles in the community. So all this coming out of about 35 to 40 people uh, volunteers, uh, and these conversations generated this activity. So I'll stop at this point, uh, but that's kind of an overview of where we are. And again, the format's the same. Uh, we, we're in one another's homes, we have a meal, uh, and then we have some important conversations. Most of the work of the dialogue has been organic and hasn't been planned. They all emanate from the power of these conversations. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, defer to questions or uh, what have you at this point? Chip, I would like to ask you um, to talk to us a bit about uh, why you chose to start with only two faith traditions, if you don't mind. Um, so why that you had that emphasis? In 2003, can you hear me? No, okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. In 2003, it seemed that that bilateral conversation was most critically needed in the community. So uh, we didn't want to, and this is, you know, this is 14 years ago, we didn't want to complicate it by bringing in the trial. The, the relations between Jews and Muslims were so uh, acutely strained in Cincinnati that we wanted at that time to focus on that, that relationship. And then in time, they, uh, in their own right, wanted to bring in Christians. That was the reason we made the choice then. Do you think that it was easier to start with two specific faith traditions than it would be to start with uh, more faith traditions or bringing in more uh, faith options into the conversation? Well, I don't, I don't know that it's if it's easier or not. Back then, it appeared to us in, in high, uh, that it was the, the best way to go. Today, it's a, a little different climate, and uh, in my view, and I so I, I think uh, I think taking on the three major traditions uh, would be fine. I don't see that as, as complicating today. Do you have any resources that you um, are able to share with others that could help them in hosting similar dinner dialogues? Well, actually, I'm working on a, because we're creating some more trialogues in the community now, one across the river in northern Kentucky, and we're going to be developing one for millennials. So we're working on a template that I will send to you, Kate, and then you can share. We have the literature pieces, of course, that I just referenced that folks are, I think you already have those online, Kate. Uh, and so I'd be happy to share that. And of course, if anyone wants to contact us and follow up, you know, we'd be happy to help anybody who has an interest. 
Thank you, Chip. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Carol. Uh, she is representing Interfaith Ministries of Greater Houston, and they have a really cool uh, perspective on their Interfaith Center Dialogue, so I will let her talk about that. Hi, everybody. Um, we've been fighting the internet here in my office, so hopefully it'll the internet gods will be in our favor at least while I, it's my turn. Um, I'm at Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. We've been doing some form of dinner dialogues in our setting now for 10 years. It started, ours are different from what's going on in Cincinnati in that they are individually self-contained events. So there's no expectation that people will continue as a, as a unified group over time. Um, and they're intended for the general public. And so really the, um, the whole point of ours is to have the opportunity for folks to sit down around the dinner table in groups of eight to 10, um, hopefully uh, in, in very diverse combinations, um, and get to know each other as people of different faiths, but on a very individual type of level. So there, in, in the way we structure it, there's no expectation that we're having any level of theological conversation or um, trying to suss out the differences in various faith traditions or how things are practiced. It's simply intended as an opportunity to get to know someone over a meal that comes from a different cultural or faith background than you do. Um, for a very long time, the primary way we did that was in homes. So we would call and develop host homes that were willing to open their homes for eight to ten folks um, that they didn't know because we would assign folks into those homes that would be complete strangers to each other. We would then also train moderators who would be different than the guests, the folks that were hosting the meal so that you, you had only one role in the evening to either be the host and hostess and um, tend to the meal and the hospitality of the evening. And then the moderator was really the one tending to the flow of the conversation um, and the timing and, and all of that of the evening. Generally, they would go about two, two and a half hours. Um, we have generated all sorts of different kinds of questions that the, that the moderator would feed into the group mostly things around people's own experience of various things in the perspective of their own faith. So we did that model for many, many years. Frozen on you all. There we go. So about five years ago, we started doing it differently. We had um, a series where um, each of our dinner dialogues was hosted by a different faith community, so same model in homes, but all hosted by Muslim families, or all hosted by Jewish families, or all hosted by Hindu families, um, which was interesting and worked for a while, but again, it kind of ran its course. Most recently, the way we've been doing what we still call our dinner dialogues program is in one of two ways. We do one every year that is one large room in our event center here in our space, um, still in tables of, of six to eight folks. Still, um, we hope that each table has a level of diversity at it, but then the conversation is facilitated from the front of the room. Um, for planning purposes, it's a whole lot easier on our end to have everybody in one space sharing one meal and then having small table conversations. The other model that we're now beginning to do is that we're hosting these dialogues in houses of worship. So that in the fall this past year, we partnered with a um, Muslim organization here in Houston along with some other, other mosques that fell excuse me, outside of that umbrella, so that we, in partnership with seven mosques, hosted about 300 people um, that were able to come have dinner at the mosque, um, observe prayer time, and then they were hosted by members of that particular mosque community for dialogue. Um,
goes again. There we go. People would be able to come to that experience in groups of five or six or seven rather than in our dinner dialogues. We really had to limit people could only come in groups of two. Um, so that we we were hoping, and I think what happened to some extent is that people could then gather groups from their congregation and go together um, into an environment that might be unfamiliar and and different for them. So we hope to do that again in the spring of next year. We're going to do it um, in partnership with the Seek community here in Houston and hopefully host dialogues in about five to six uh, gurdwaras. And again, the community will provide the hospitality and a fabulous meal and folks will be able to see what it looks like inside a Sikh gurdwara, hear from the Sikh community a little bit about who they are and then engage in dialogue with them. Um, we, we really think of dinner dialogues in terms of our overall programming as sort of our entry level event. It's um, the hopefully the easiest way for folks to get their their toes in the water of interfaith dialogue um, for the first time. Uh, we we really do set the stage that the idea is for people to speak only from their own experience. Um, we we try to let everyone off the hook of not expecting being expected to be the expert even in their own faith, only in their own experience of their own faith. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the big pieces of it. What else? I I really like that um, you explained an interfaith inner dialogue as the way of dipping your toes in the water. I think that's a great way to explain it because um, it's a great way to interact with people of different faiths and begin having those conversations. And I like that you take a step away from the intellectual aspect to really dive into the community building. Um, so I would like to ask you. Um, what you personally think is has been more effective these intimate conversations or more of these larger conversations that you've had with these interfaith inner dialogues so we definitely have a contingent that much prefers the the more intimate in someone's home piece of that the challenge from a macro expect uh, level of that is that we found very quickly we were essentially just shuffling the same deck over and over again. Um, so we have, you know, our set of 200, 250 people that every time we put on a dinner dialogue will be our participants. What, what that wasn't, um, there we go. So what that was not expanding our group very well. Um, the hope with doing things in either a single large setting or in now a handful of medium sized settings is that it provides more accessibility. Houston is a huge, huge, huge place. So one of our significant barriers is geography. You know, we're not going to get people traveling all the way across the city so we have to or coming into the center of the city where our building is so we really do have to pay attention to taking events close to where people are um, I'm looking at this question about diversity in homes when we do dinner dialogues in very small settings we don't let groups of 10 come together um, simply because that then makes us unable to get faith diversity around a single table. Um, when we do these dialogues hosted by faith communities in their houses of worship, we're willing to give up the diversity of the crowd that's participating in that space um, for the sake of giving perhaps Christians their first opportunity of being in a mosque. Or, um, you know, when we go into the gurdwaras, this may be the first opportunity that people have had to be in a gurdwara. So we, we sacrifice the diversity of that particular group for the experience of being in an unusual space for our participants, if, if that makes sense. Um, 
And in that case, then the dialogue wasn't necessarily about each person's individual faith tradition, but more about learning about that particular faith tradition that was hosting the, the dinner event. Uh, Carol, last I'd like to ask if you have um, any resources you could share with others or tips uh, and advice that you would give to people who are interested in hosting their own events like this. Um, I think we do have, we've done some a very basic community guide that we share with folks when they want to try to put Let it catch up. Some of our basic tips for training moderators, some of our um, sort of baseline questions that we ask to get conversations started. Um, I think what we have learned most over the years is just get started. Um, and that even if your first dialogue is 10 people, that's, that's the place to start. Um, the other thing I think that we have learned and have learned to live with is the idea that short of a stable group like what's happening in Cincinnati, no matter how we frame the evening in terms of a theme or questions, in general, the conversation is always the same. You put a group of 10 strangers around a table together, you, you definitively put questions in front of them, but in general, the conversation always comes back to folks connecting on the level that people connect on. What it is about themselves that they find similar, questions they have about how each other practices their own faith. And so we quit fighting that. And we have, again, that's why we consider the dialogue sort of our entry level experience. It's going to feel like the same event over and over and over again, even with if you're with different people every time, because the conversation tends to be very similar every time. Thank you so much, Carol. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I am going to ask Jennifer a few questions. Jennifer is representing uh, both a movement and an organization. She's representing the 100 Days, 100 Dinners initiative, which launched after the election, and Faith Matters Network. So I will let her talk about this. Hey everybody, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, well, it's so lovely to be with you all. My name is Reverend Jennifer Bailey. I'm the founder and executive director of Faith Matters Network, which is a people of color led organization based here in Nashville, Tennessee, catalyzing 21st century religious leadership. Um, I could talk more about what that means in the Q&A, but I am so pleased today to be representing a coalition of organizations um, that has been running a campaign since the election called 100 Days, 100 Dinners. Um, 100 Days, 100 Dinners really came out of a partnership between my organization, Faith Matters Network, an organization called Hella Back, which works on online and street harassment, and an organization called The Dinner Party, which is a collective of 20 and 30-somethings who gather regularly over potluck dinners um, to process traumatic loss, um, generally folks who have lost a loved one. And in the aftermath of the election, um, all three of our organizations came together thinking about what we might be able to offer the world in this particular historical moment when so many people within our own communities um, were feeling a, a space of grief, um, feeling a space of trauma, certainly, and many were feeling the desire to do what we would call bridging work across lines of difference. Because if uh, the election did anything and the election cycle did anything, it exposed to us just how deeply free the ties that bind our democracy are. And so given the expertise of the dinner party in throwing, what you might imagine, dinner parties, we thought that um, one framework that we might be able to use to begin circling people up across different lines of difference was the framework of a potluck dinner. And so on January 20th, 2016, we kicked off this campaign, 100 Days, 100 Dinners. Um, thus far, we've had over 100 dinners, which is very exciting during the first 100 days of the presidential administration. Um, and we've heard from folks in over 200 communities nationwide um, folks from places like Miami, Florida, and Helena, Montana, 
here in Nashville, Tennessee, Chicago, Illinois, big cities, small cities, small towns you've never heard of. Um, and the idea behind our framework is really this. Um, we run two different tracks within the campaign. One um, that we call Be and Belong, which is really focusing on how we provide support for communities that have been on the front lines um, of different forms of trauma, oppression in the aftermath of the election. So our track one dinners, Be and Belong dinners, are really focused on circling up with people that you know to really fortify and provide healing spaces um, for folks who um, are you know, in the midst of really immense struggle and trauma in this moment. Um, one example is that of that are communities, um, African American communities that have circled up sort of to process um, incidents of police violence. We've had immigrant refugee communities in light of some of the travel bans that have emerged to circle up, all with the hope of really deeply fortifying the relationships that bind them together. Uh, the second track, which has been our most popular track, we've called Where Do We Go From Here, which is based on Dr. Martin Luther King's 1967 text, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And that track of dinners is really about bridging across lines of difference, most often across lines of partisan or ideological difference in this historical context, but also across lines of racial difference, um, across lines of identity difference across lines of class. And so the format for our dinners, most of them have been potluck style and hosted in folks' homes. Um, people have been invited to, to bring a dish that comes from their deepest um, space of community. And then um, we circle up and we have a set of agreements that we invite into this space um, that are really focused on providing people with a context for how we might engage one another in dialogue together. And those agreements are pretty straightforward. Um, the first is I will grant you welcome in exchange for receiving it. The second, I will show up and be present and open to creating this experience together. The third is I will speak and listen with truth and love, agreeing or disagreeing with respect and kindness. And we found that beginning our dialogues with that pretty open space, of um, inviting people to the table has been incredibly profound for folks in their ability to open up. We have the same set of three questions that we ask each dinner, which is very much rooted in a, a space of story and the particularity of story. Um, and it's been striking. We've had similar experiences from um, folks circling up. I have a dear friend who's being been leading conversations on Capitol Hill of all places, um, a space where we don't imagine there being a lot of uh, bridging across lines of difference in this conversation. For the sake of her job, I will not totally reveal what she does for a living, but suffice it to say, she works in the Senate um, in a pretty high up position. And you know, when this concept came about in the first 100 days period, she reached out to me and said, Jen, I think we could really use this on Capitol Hill. So she circled up with some staffers um, in a prominent member of the House's um, office of the opposite party. And they've been hosting these dinner dialogues over the past couple of months, um, largely in secret, because <laughs> as you can imagine, DC is a very fraught place um, in this moment. But it's been a space for these young folks who went to DC um, with the idea of changing the world um, and who find themselves on both sides of the political divide, um, not exactly being able to lean into that, that, that really um, earnest desire uh, to um, enact positive change for our communities. Um, and so it's been striking to me that they find this dinner space is the one space where they can be completely honest, not only with one another, but with themselves about the state of our democracy um, and begin to imagine connections um, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, I've led dinners on college campuses in Fort Worth, Texas and in Miami, Florida. So it's been really awesome to see the ways in which this work is translated in different contexts, whether it be on a college campus or on Capitol Hill or within a congregation. We've had churches who've adopted this as a, as a model for them to begin dialogues as well. And so I'd invite you to check out our website. It's not too late. Um, 
100days100dinners.us. And I will let you all be the first to know that after this first 100 days, there is a phase two coming, um, tentatively called the People Suffer. And so the campaign will officially end on April 29th, which is the 100th day of the Trump administration. But we have some good work coming forward. And on the website, you'll find um, two toolkits that we use, one for the Be and Belong dinners, um, for sort of an intra-community gathering, and one for our Bridging Across Lines of Difference conversation as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, would you mind talking a bit or sharing an example of one specific dinner that you might have found really captivating, uh, whether it was in Miami or Nashville, or just giving us an example? Yeah, so I'll share. I actually um, was invited. I'm an alumni of Interfaith Youth Corps, which is a national organization that works with college and university students to make interfaith cooperation a social norm, and was invited to the campus of Texas Christian University um, in, gosh, March, no, it must have been February. February is part of a gathering they were doing called the Southwest Interfaith Roundup. Um, and as part of that conversation, which brought together students from across the state of Texas who were interested in engaging in interfaith dialogue, um, they invited me to lead 100 Days 100 Dinners dinner there. And it was striking to me, I was sitting at a table with a young man who was a refugee from Nepal, um, a young Muslim woman, um, two African American students, and two white students um, at TCU, which is, you know, it's a deeply Christian place. <laughs> and what's striking to me is how much those students, um, when asked our first question, which was, um, from whom and where did you first learn about being a citizen, the breadth of answers they gave. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not yet 30, but I am also not 18 anymore. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm constantly delighted and surprised and learn so much from the ways in which young people are beginning to engage this question of what it means for us to, to have deep relationships and dialogue. Um, the young man in that group who was a refugee from Nepal eventually broke out um, into tears and in part um, because he was thinking about and sharing a story of what it meant for his family to have the opportunity to move um, to the United States and was really distraught about what it might mean that other people who were escaping and fleeing violence wouldn't have that opportunity as well. And so it's that type of story sharing that I've found to be really poignant and powerful and that it doesn't take much but an invitation, um, an invitation to be brave, um, an invitation to share, to open folks up. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, one of our uh, attendees has been sending us a few questions about dietary rules with interfaith in our dialogues, and his latest comment is about um, not bringing pork or uh, wine to different Islamic centers, um, as that can be seen as rude or disrespectful. I have a funny story about this, actually, uh, where our CEO here, Maha, um, was talking with a rabbi that she's really close with, and the rabbi invited her to come to Seder, and Maha asked, oh, well, what should I bring? And the rabbi said, oh, you should bring a bottle of wine. And Maha just found it hilarious and laughed, and they bonded. Um, but just having those conversations and being open to having those conversations and saying, um, please don't bring this, but we would invite you to bring this um, so that others are aware and having an open dialogue, I think, is the best way to deal with these situations. Um, they also um, told us a story about how um, Scroll up. Uh, some Jewish communities don't share meals from others. Not even a water bottle is accepted. They asked if any of us have faced this challenge um, and how they, how we've come around with dietary and cultural reservations or sensitivities. Um, so I'm going to talk first because it gives me an opportunity to talk about a program here at ING. Uh, we have a program called Aholic Seder, which is a curriculum for um, interfaith and dialogues, and it centers on relationships between Jews and Muslims and the importance of the, the story of Exodus in both traditions. And so we don't really engage in interfaith dinner dialogues a lot. We are more of an education organization, but we have had a lot of fun with this curriculum, and it's been really successful, and we are starting to have other groups adopt this other places as well. We have one group in New York, another San Diego, that we think are going to take this on. And 
make it their own, um, but there are different plays that are interacted, or um, we have different actors that act out different plays and variations, such as woman in the story of Exodus and how that's represented in both the Torah and the Tanakh and within the Quran, and just small differences that might be within these interpretations, but really that the overall message is the same throughout the story of Exodus in both traditions, so emphasizing that. Um, but that brings me back to uh, the last Holocaust Seder we just had um, was in a very conservative synagogue. And so usually with um, catering and dinner, we will find something that is kosher and it's not too difficult. But this time it was a serious challenge because everything that comes into the synagogue needs to be okay with the rabbi. The rabbi has to look at every single thing and say, this is all right, this is acceptable. Um, and so I think we just went, up, went for it and just made everything vegetarian and uh, made sure that we didn't offend anybody and that all food sensitivities were addressed. There were gluten-free options, vegan options, everything uh, that you can think of. So I think that's a good way to deal with it is making sure you have enough options for all food sensitivities and doing it from that perspective. Um, but if Chip, Carol, or Jennifer have different examples of how they've address food sensitivities, um, I'd like for them to share. A number of people, but uh, I, it's, uh, you know, our, our hosts uh, have learned over time of, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, what are the dietary uh, uh, restrictions of, of the, of their, of the other members of the trial. But just the other day we had a, uh, a Jewish host um, called her a Muslim friend and said, I want to be sensitive to your needs. And so was reminded about alcohol, et cetera. So, I mean, they're, they're getting in the habit uh, interpersonally uh, in our situation to do that. Now in a more public situation, I'm sure Carol and perhaps Jennifer, uh, by the way, I really enjoyed your talks. Thank you very much. We're going to try to go from our leadership model to grassroots and reach more folks. So you've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. So uh, I'll defer to them on the dietary uh, issues in the larger context. So I'll just share in our own context, one of the, the beauties of potluck dinners is that there's an invitation for folks to bring and share um, from their own sort of perspective and cultural tradition. And so um, we, we get to loop around <laughs> a lot of ways in those um, conflicts because it's folks bringing their own food um, often to the gatherings to share. Generally speaking, we invite our hosts um, to offer a main dish and that that dish is vegetarian, um, just so that it kind of avoids some of those conflicts that might all otherwise be there in terms of dietary restrictions. Yeah, I think we've all found many of the same workarounds. Um, we encourage when, when our hosts are responsible for the meal, we encourage again, either fully vegetarian or with a significant vegetarian option. Um, we have to train some folks that just because there's a salad does not mean that you now have a vegetarian meal. Um, and we, we discourage all pork and seafood just because then we stay away from it completely. And for a variety of reasons, dietary restrictions being a significant one, we really discourage um, the serving of alcohol at any of our events. When we host it, there is no alcohol, and we really ask in our host homes that there be no alcohol, mostly so that that doesn't um, color the conversation at all, and it just keeps that in a very safe space. Thank you. Um, I would I, also go ahead, Chip. Yes, I, I, I need to excuse myself at this point, and my sincere apologies to my colleagues on the panel. And uh, as Kate knows, I have a a um, a commitment I've got to keep, uh, and I probably need to excuse myself. But thank you for the privilege of of uh, sharing this experience with you all. Thank you so much, Chip. And I will um, send out your resources to everybody who's attending this panel. Afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.
Okay. So on that note, I would like to ask uh, Carol and Jennifer to maybe share some stories of things that have gone awry or things that <laughs> might have not gone as planned within an interfaith inner dialogue and what they did to correct that situation. No, that's a challenging question. <laughs> well, I think it's challenging because for the most part, I think we are always pleasantly surprised that there there tends to be a, a pretty much a lack of significant issues at any of our events. Um, I think people come to these because they're curious, because they they want to have an open mind. The only times that I can think of offhand really where we've had any kind of feedback that things didn't go as planned was when we had a moderator or a facilitator who just didn't really clearly understand their role so that we'll get comments that they um, that they really ran over the conversation that it became an opportunity for them to talk more about themselves than engage the conversation from the group um, but for the most part I think We've been scared, for example, when we did our first dinner dialogue right after Texas enacted open carry last year. Um, we got some questions from our various host homes about how we were going to handle that or from some of our participants, how open carry into someone's home would be handled. So we had to do some thinking around how much can we dictate versus how much do we have to trust, trust our, our group. Um, and, and I think repeatedly we've been pleasantly surprised that the folks who choose to engage in this work come at it um, honestly and come at it with the best of intentions. So we've not had significant issues. So we'll say um, we have not had any um, major disasters <laughs> just yet. We've only been in the business for, you know, 90, we'll be in the business for 100 days, um, and we haven't quite hit the 90-day mark. So fingers crossed, no big disasters happen. Um, but one challenge that I think has been really live for us is um, particularly as we're bridging people across lines of political difference at a time when that is not... Um, a norm, nor is it particularly encouraged in a lot of spaces. One challenge has been actually getting people from different political backgrounds, particularly conservative folks, to show up at dinner tables. And you know, knowing that there is a very real suspicion of the other in this moment, um, part of our challenge has been actually being able to craft and. Um, in a meaningful and thoughtful and humble way, invitations that people feel like they can accept um, and take the risk to accept because we know that this is risky business in this political and social environment to actually sit down with someone who's different from us and can be viewed as a radical act. Um, just striking for me as a, as a Christian minister in the midst of Holy Week when I think about for myself, the example of Jesus was always sitting with people who were radically different. <laughs> um, but that's not the environment we live in. And so some of our um, strategies has been really intentional outreach to conservative religious communities, so folks who already have a framework um, for doing dinner-based work, um, and really reaching out through different networks and organizations that we know and trust um, to offer those personal invitations to folks. Um, but I would be lying to you if I said it wasn't challenging. <laughs> and half the battle is getting folks into the room to begin with. I absolutely echo that. Um, one of our, where we want to be next is moving beyond what we're calling our choir, to, to borrow from Christian terminology, we realize that we're getting folks who are naturally inclined to this, but that doesn't do the work of helping to move folks who are on the, the next layer, the next edges. So that's, that's really where we want to spend our energy next. So our panelist, uh, or our um, webinar attendee, Mukaram, asked us another question. Um, for a future event, um, how can we reach out to people in different rural parts of the country? And I think that is a very difficult uh, part of interfaith work, is making sure that we are not just yeah, preaching to our own choir, preaching to our own group, that we are expanding and we're talking to others. And I think often interfaith initiatives are 
in the cities and not necessarily in the suburbs or in the countryside. And I know that um, one of our interfaith partners, uh, Spokane Interfaith Council, is in not quite so much of a city environment and they have, um, they found ways to engage with their community. Same with uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is another one of our partners. They found ways to engage um, in a smaller town. And so I'd like to ask uh, both of you if you have any examples of reaching out to people um, that might be harder to access or finding ways to build bridges in, with others that might not automatically be interested in something like this. So I will tell you that one of the places where we find people engaging more easily, um, we've done now for two years in a row, a, an intentionally interfaith youth day of service. Um, and this last year, we intentionally put it on Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, for, for all of the obvious reasons and that it's a day of service um, and it, it's focused on that, but also because conveniently, it's a day when the kids are out of school, but it keeps us off of everyone's worship time over the weekend. So it made it a day where people could potentially get there. Um, the thing about doing a service project together, or actually in this case, a variety of service projects together, is that I think the pressure's off. And I think um, for some, the idea that you're going to come sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation where you will be, the spotlight will be on you for at least part of that. The internet went out again. There we are, are we back? Mm -hmm. um, I think the dialogue, the sitting down face to face can be a little intimidating. Participating together in a service project is something that, that people of all walks of life value. It um, gives people an opportunity to work side by side um, in, a, in a little bit less sort of focused and potentially intimidating setting. So we've, we've had some experience with, with connecting with groups that we might not otherwise connect with that way. Yeah, and I'll share part of our outreach strategy has been intentionally through denominations and faith communities. And one thing that, um, you know, denominations, even on a conference level for many Christian communities, have is access to suburban and rural communities that identify with them. And so that's been one strategy that we found to be particularly effective um, certainly, I'm based in Nashville, Tennessee, but we are a stone's throw from rural America here in Middle Tennessee. And so we've reached out to some of our friends and partners um, in suburban and rural areas. Um, we've hosted dinners in Columbia, Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, places that you wouldn't anticipate. Um, one thing that's also been very striking to us uh, as part of this being an open campaign is that we invite people um, to sign up to host a dinner or who are interested in attending a dinner. And you would be surprised at the number of folks who have, we have reached out to us from cities and towns we've never heard of, right? Um, and so I say that to say, um, i give you some examples because I just pulled up the list. Um, Milton, Delaware, and Waxhaw, North Carolina, and you know, Helena, Montana, you know, places that you wouldn't naturally assume there would be interest in this type of work. And so I, I share that as a word of encouragement. Part of the, the challenge as folks talk about reaching out to rural America is often folks just don't reach out to rural America. Um, they don't take the time to invest in taking that drive outside of the city to, to meet their neighbors in different areas. And so I would just encourage you to think about um, who some of those potential partners might be, whether it's with other religious communities, or if you, you have a relative or friend who might live in a suburban or rural community, to reach out to them and see if they might be interested in hosting a dinner. Thank you so much. Um, so we are running out of time. So in closing, I would like to ask our panelists if they have any final tips, tricks, or final reflections to share with us. I think the, the thing that is very easy to forget um, that I, we all know, but we, we don't give ourselves much patience with is that at the core, it all comes back to relationships. 
And so people will come to things because they have a relationship with either you as the organization or someone they trust who invited them in or whatever. And that relationship building is slow work. Um, so to be patient with yourselves um, when you're doing this because you, you just cannot um, instantly force relationship. It takes time. That's really great and very true advice. <laughs> <laughs> That, that. Um, you know, I always, I guess I would just say one thing that we open most of our dinners with is a poem around what we've been calling brave space. We know that in this current moment, there really is no such thing as safe space for folks, um, and particularly the, the work of actually gathering around the table across lines of difference, whatever difference that might be, requires some risk. And so I would say honor, you know, um, the risk that people are taking, the courage that it takes to sometimes show up in these spaces. And um, I would offer a word of, you know, humility, right, is, is key to recognizing that we're not all gonna have the answers. And certainly we have, all have areas to grow from. But if we commit to creating these brave spaces together, perhaps we can see the world that we want to. Thank you. Beautiful closing thoughts from both of you. Thank you both for the work you're doing for building these bridges and also for joining this webinar and sharing your work with us. Um, thank you to everybody who tuned in. I will be sending out a list of resources as well as this recording uh, shortly. And uh, I really appreciate everybody making the time to watch this video. Um, so uh, in closing, I would like to invite everyone to learn more about the Know Your Neighbor community and the different efforts going on within this coalition. And also to be sure to tune into our next webinar at the end of this month on stereotypes against the Sikh, Hindu, and Muslim communities. We will be joined by three young uh, Sikh, or one young Sikh, one young Hindu, and one young Muslim to talk about growing up in America and stereotypes that they have been faced with and um, just talking about their faith in this country. Um, so thank you all so much. And it was a pleasure to have you all on this webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Take care, everyone. Bye.